Welcome to the online audience. I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation and, uh, and really a warm welcome to uh, Secretary of the Air Force, Frank Kendall. Uh, actually, we should say welcome back. Uh, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's good terrific. to be back, Alan. Yeah. Thank you. It's right. terrific to have you here. Um, so, Secretary Kendall, you know, um, we all know America uh, spends a lot of money um, on defense, some $773 billion in, in this year's Pentagon budget, uh, um, uh, just as a start. Um, the Air Force uh, makes up about 30% of that budget, um, and you are in charge of all of it, from fighter jets and stealth bombers to cutting-edge uh, research programs. Uh, but I think what's clear is that uh, more than the attention-grabbing weapon systems, uh, the Air Force's people, um, and an impressive and diverse group of, uh, of men and women uh, from every walk of life and serving in nearly all corners of, of the world. And that's a, a story that's probably not as visible to uh, many of the people who, who aren't living inside the Air Force. Um, Secretary Kendall's made it clear that uh, competing for and retaining country's top talent, again, to help defend the national security is a top order priority. Um, he's leading groundbreaking reforms uh, within the Air Force to make it a more inclusive, diverse uh, environment, again, to recruit, retain, and uh, uh, promote the Air Force's top talent. Uh, for example, the Air Force is uh, providing full reproductive health care, carrying out regular disparity reviews, modernizing uniforms for f female airmen, um, are just some examples. And uh, we hope Secretary, Kerry, uh, Secretary Kendall may tell us about, about others. Um, but the Air Force is also on the front line of addressing some of the most pressing transnational challenges the US and the world uh, are facing. Threats to democracy uh, from Russia's aggression, dire uh, challenges of uh, from the climate crisis and the fight against COVID and other uh, global pandemic diseases, to name a few. These cross-cutting and uh, transnational challenges are the very issues that CAP sees as the priority policy challenges for today and the future. Uh, we're studying them, we're devising solutions, and working with partners to achieve outcomes that can improve the lives of Americans and people around the world same mission that the Air Force is uh, pursuing. Uh, so we look forward to discussing all these crucial topics uh, with the Secretary today. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be with you. Great. So uh, Secretary Kendall, uh, you know, you've got a full plate. You've got a lot of, uh, you've got immediate challenges. You've got uh, things that you're looking at over the medium and the long term. Uh, challenges as we've identified, Russia, um, the, uh, China is a strategic competitor, international airlifts. Give us a sense for what, what are you focusing on from, uh, in, in your waking hours? What are, what are, what are the, what is the questions that, that you're grappling with? Uh, that's a pretty easy question, actually. It's the reason I came back in the government, uh, more than any other by far, is my concerns about China's military modernization program. And when people ask me what my priorities are, I tend to say China, China, China. Um, we, in our national defense strategy, we, we, we talk about China being a pacing challenge. Um, we talk about Russia being an acute threat. We talk about Iran, North Korea, and violent extremist groups as certainly on the list, and uh, not to be ignored by any means. But the only uh, nation state that has the, the capacity, the resources, the strategic intent, uh, to really threaten the United States as a leader in the world and the system that we created after World War II is China. I first became alarmed about China's modernization program in 2010. I've been out of government at that point for about 15 years. And I started looking at the intelligence on what they were investing in. And it was quite obvious to me that they were basically trying to field the capability to defeat the American ability to project power in the Western Pacific. And they had, they had studied what we had done in the first Gulf War and since. And they had started making investments to go after uh, the things that we depend upon to protect power. Uh, the, I'm, I'm the secretary for both the Air Force and the Space Force. Right. Part of that is our satellites that we depend upon uh, for services to the Joint Force. Uh, aircraft carriers are on that list. 
Ford airfields on that list. Uh, in addition to doing all those things, threatening all those targets, and a few others such as communications nodes and command and control and logistics nodes, they try to compete with us in areas like air superiority, where traditionally the U.S. had had a major advantage. So this, this, the mission comes first, and the people are critically important because they're the people that do the mission, right? Uh, Secretary Austin had a note that he put out, a memo to the force uh, over a year ago, which talked about mission, people, and teams. And all are critically important. They all work together. My, my mantra as secretary has been one team, one fight. And the idea that we all need to be uh, aware of our role on the national security team. Uh, that includes our international partners, of course. It includes the other services. It includes whole of government considerations. Uh, but it's basically about keeping in mind why we exist as a service or services and what our mission is overall, and then making us as capable as possible of, of carrying out those missions. Got it. Um, that, that's very interesting. And the, the uh, kind of that, that unified holistic approach to this really kind of looming challenge of China, I think is critical. Can you give us a little bit of a sense for uh, of respecting confidences, et cetera, how the Air Force is looking at this challenge. And what are, have, have you viewed adjustments to how, how we've been looking at, uh, um, at this challenge? What, sure. what, in what way have we done that? Yeah, we have a series of missions and a series of priorities, in the, again, in the national defense strategy. Right. Uh, we have to provide two legs of the strategic deterrent. Right. Uh, I already talked about arms control. Uh, we have a role there, but our primary role in, in the strategic deterrent is providing the ICBM force uh, and the bomber force, two legs of the triad. And we're in the process of recapitalizing both of those legs right now. We're also modernizing command and control to make sure that that's secure. Uh, we also have a role in warning, uh, missile warning systems, for example, and strategic communication. So that part of our mission, I, I think, is in relatively good shape. We have a set of programs either ongoing or, or in place uh, to perform that mission. Where I thought we had a challenge was with our power projection again. Uh, the, the U.S. provides security guarantees to a number of allies and partners around the world. And our first and foremost, we're trying to deter aggression. And we all just had a wake-up call about that in, right. in the Ukraine. Great powers do commit acts of aggression, and we just saw one that I don't think a lot of people, uh, were, a lot of people were surprised right. by. Uh, so we have a concern with Russia, obviously, which has more than once demonstrated its capacity for aggression. But we also have a concern in the Pacific. And the obvious target for China is Taiwan. But they have basically tried to establish control of the South China Sea. They contest the Senkakus with, with Japan. Mm -hmm. So our ability to project power, and it's been a unique American capability since World War II. Uh, I've earlier days of my career, I was uh, an Army officer in, in in, in Germany, when there were two Germans. Mm -hmm. And we were there to prevent uh, an act of aggression by the Soviets at the time. So I have about 20 years of kind of visceral mm -hmm. experience with that sort of a situation. And unfortunately, it, it, it's back. You know, we, we thought things would change permanently at the end of the Cold War, and they have not. So uh, China's mounted a, a very serious challenge. The, the way I've organized the work of the Department of the Air Force to address that challenge is through a list of operational imperatives. It's essentially a list of military functions that we have to be able to perform if we're going to be successful at deterring or resisting and defeating aggression. Uh, and I can walk you through the list real right. quickly. Yeah, it starts please. with space and getting our future space order of battle right. For decades, we have had a space suite of capabilities based on the idea that we had impunity, that we mm -hmm. weren't threatened in space. That's right. not true. It's okay. not been true for some time. During the Obama administration, we, we changed our strategy for space to recognize that space had become a war fighting domain, whether we liked it or not. Right. The threats were being built to challenge our space systems. Uh, so getting space order battle right is first. Second is um, our ability to command and control the joint force, mm -hmm. our part of it, the Air Force and Space Forces. There's a concept called joint all domain command and control, which was initiated during the previous administration but which, to my view, lacked focus and wasn't properly integrated. Um, so we were organized to go do that. That's mm -hmm. something on my list. The, the next thing is the targeting systems that allow the command and control system to bring effects to bear on targets. Uh, our targets, if we're deterring aggression, are things that move, mm -hmm. airborne or ground targets, right. either ships or, or land vehicles. Okay. So getting a suite of sensors in place that are survivable and resilient 
uh, that can deter or that can effectively you know, provide that service to the rest of the force. Uh, then there's a, a core capability of the Air Force, which is air superiority and the next generation of air dominance. Uh, there's a program I started in my previous role in the Pentagon that has led to prototypes for the next generation, sixth generation, if you will, fighters. Uh, but it's more than that. It's a family of systems, and we're going to introduce uncrewed combat aircraft for the first time mm -hmm. to work in conjunction with the manned aircraft to mm -hmm. be under their control. Uh, next on the list is resiliency of our forward bases. We use fixed installations that are within range of missiles launched from whatever, by whatever means, uh, and are very targetable. So we have to make those bases hardened enough or strong enough that they can you know, continue to operate sure. under attack. Uh, the Air Force's concept for this is called Agile Combat Employment, and basically it's the idea you don't stay on the one base, you move to other places uh, so that the enemy doesn't know where you are, mm -hmm. and you provide a combination of deception, hardening, and defenses. So getting those investments uh, sorted out in a way which is as cost-effective as possible. Uh, then there's the long-range strike capability, and that family of systems built around uh, the B-21, which will enter production fairly mm -hmm. shortly. And then finally, there's all the things that we depend upon to go to war. Uh, this is a lot of information systems mm -hmm. uh, where cyber attacks are certainly possible, but there are also critical nodes that we depend upon, which could be attacked kinetically. So that's the seven. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent most of the last year analyzing the most cost-effective things to do about each of those, and we're now in the process of building the 24 budget. There were a few things that we put into the 23 budget that the Congress is you know, in the process of mm -hmm. passing. Uh, so a lot of the, the last year has been spent sorting all that out uh, and putting on the table what we think we need to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously we're uh, just in a whole different world uh, in 2022 compared to your time when you were in Germany and uh, mm -hmm. dealing with a different threat in a, in a different era. But can you tell us a little bit, uh, as, you, as you reflect back on uh, your time uh, in Germany mm -hmm. and how we, we were postured, uh, both the United States but uh, within the NATO alliance, sure. and looking at, the, kind of mapping that against the threat that you identify in China and our allies in the, in the Western Pacific, can you draw some co sure. uh, comparisons and uh, contrasts? It's, a, it's so. a great question because uh, it's certainly not a one-for-one -one right. comparison. Um, when you look at the picture largely, one, one of the most important changes, I think, most significant changes, has been the Chinese break out of their nuclear force. Mm -hmm. So we're now going to be in a world in which China has a nuclear arsenal comparable to both Russia and the United States. For decades, China kept a relatively small right. force, clearly a second strike capability. Yeah. Um, uh, frankly, I would have liked to see in a world in which all the great powers went to that kind of right. a force. Right. That hasn't happened. It's the other alternative has happened. So we're going to be plunged into a tripolar world, uh, and I think there's a lot of risk in that. Mm -hmm. And Rudy mentioned um, arms control. We, we need to do some discussions with the Chinese about risk reduction right. and understanding how we manage the risk associated with what they're doing. Um, so th there's that aspect right. of it, which is very different. Yeah. The other thing is that in, in Europe, uh, when I was there, we had a large force there on the ground. We had uh, a large conventional force backed up by a lot of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and those were backed up by strategic mm -hmm. weapons. And we had an alliance. Right. So there was never any question that we would fight. And there was a good deal, in, and the Soviets had to have a lot of concern about whether they could prevail even in the conventional mm -hmm. fight. And then they had to worry about escalation. So there were a lot of terms in the equation they had to think about before they took the risk of launching right. an aggressive act. We don't have some of those elements mm -hmm. in the Pacific. Um, now, the importance of our strategic partners, I think, is evident from the Cold War and how that right. played out. It's very evident about what's going on in Ukraine right now. Yeah. The NATO alliance is much stronger as a result of Russia's act of aggression. Right. Uh, in the Pacific, we have bilateral alliances right. instead of a NATO-type organization, yep. Japan and Australia principally, and also South Korea. Right. So they're not the same. The right. other thing that's very different is the degree to which China's economy is entwined with the yep. global economy. Right. The Soviet economy existed pretty much separately right. of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is very different. Yep. And so it's not the same. There are factors that make the risk greater, I think, right. some that make it less. Um, one, one hope I have, Alan, is that China's watching the Ukraine situation. Right. And what they're learning from it is that uh, uh, the, um, a number of things. First of all is that 
uh, your military not, may not be nearly as good as they're telling you mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. Another is that the short war you expect may not be the war that you actually get. Yeah. And the third is that the economic consequences, which the regime in China cares about very much, uh, may be very severe uh, and more than you can stand. Right. So I'm hoping that yep. those are the lessons China takes. I'm not sure that they will be. Yeah, that uh, it's it's a black box, really. So anyway, um, we've uh, we've talked a little bit about about it, um, but let's dig a little bit deeper on uh, how you're looking at Ukraine uh, sure. and. Uh, um, you know, the Air Force has had a central role in the in how how we've uh, taken the, a government-wide approach to Ukraine, um, uh, countering Russian aggression and making clear U.S. statements on the national security interest in defending democracy um, abroad. Can you give us a, a, a scoping of how the Air Force is approaching the um, what's happening um, uh, on the conflict in, in Ukraine? Sure. Um, most of the equipment transfers have been ground equipment, um, most of the Army. Um, we have, there are some uh, items of equipment that the Air Force has provided mm -hmm. to, and I'm not sure how much is public about some of those, mm -hmm. but basically uh, it's been a ground campaign. Uh, one of the surprises in the conflict has been that the, the Russians could not take control of the air. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, credit to the Ukrainian military for how they use their air defenses. Mm -hmm. Um, demonstrated a, a lack of training capability by the Russians. Mm -hmm. It was significant. Um, we are obviously involved in transportation. Right. You know, Mobility Command is involved in that. Yeah. The Space Force is involved also. Mm -hmm. uh, we're providing, uh, you know, our space assets, for okay. our sources of information right. okay. that can be very helpful to yep. the Ukrainians. Okay. No, it's interesting. Uh, uh, not to get uh, too far afield, I've I've just been intrigued by uh, how our I think the world kind of underestimated uh, Russia's uh, inability to control the, the airspace over Ukraine. Can you elaborate a little bit on how, uh, how you see that? You, you first of all have to yeah. give an awful lot of credit to the Ukrainians. Right. Um, they have Soviet era air defenses primarily. Yeah. They have um, stingers, unmanned portable systems that we provided. Um, they've used their, those systems very, very effectively. Right. Uh, a a well-trained opponent would have been able to overwhelm what they did, yeah. but the, the Russians were obviously not well trained, right. quite the opposite. Yeah. And as soon as they started taking losses, they pulled their air back, right. and they've kept it back, basically. Yeah. Um, so it, it, there are some lessons to be learned from that, obviously. Right. Um, it, it, it was a surprise. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't expect the Russians to be anywhere near as good as we are, for example, right. but we expect them to be better than they are. Sure, sure. Uh, and I know it's an apples and oranges comparison, but uh, you, know, you look at, uh, both what happened with Russia on uh, control of the airspace, obviously the, um, the failures on the ground uh, with mm -hmm. their armed forces. Do you see any implications to their capabilities uh, in control, command and control of their strategic assets? Um, I don't see a direct correlation. Yeah. Okay. I'm not alarmed by that okay. failure tactically. Um, I, 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 would have to get an intelligence I really can't yeah. discuss, but right. um, I, I am not concerned about their ability to keep control of their nuclear weapons okay. at this point. Okay, okay, interesting, thanks. So, you know, in addition to the, uh, the Air Force's support for um, the Ukraine effort, um, it's also played a crucial role in uh, other humanitarian missions around the world, right? Um, a few examples are flying baby formula into the United States, uh, the lift uh, evacuation uh, from Kabul, uh, and then most recently, our, our support to Pakistan uh, in its response to the floods. Oh, most recently, uh, our support to Florida today. That as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the Air Force's um, posture and role in humanitarian um, uh, we, we, response? We, we, we do play a key role. Um, I don't know that we got as much credit for this as we, as we probably should have. The, the evacuation from Afghanistan was an unprecedented mm -hmm operation and carried off very, very professionally. Right. Great credit to all of our, our air crews and our maintainers and everybody else right. involved. The other thing that we did, and the Army had a role in this too, uh, was re receipt of the people that came from Afghanistan and helping them transition into right. the United States. Two of our bases were used for that. Yeah. And the people there performed incredibly well. Right. So we have, uh, 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 people take great pride in the Air Force. Uh, in what they do there. And again, I'll bring in the Space Force. Yeah, the please. Space Force sensors, again, can play a role in understanding the situation on the yeah. ground and helping aid 
you know, go to where it's needed the most. Right, right. No, that's great. Um, so I wanted to turn a little bit to the U U.S. domestic uh, view as we, you know, so Russia's aggression has obviously uh, brought uh, into bright light the uh, threats of authoritarianism to, uh, towards democracy. Uh, but at home we face, you know, uh, different but compelling threats to um, democratic norms and some of those threats are uh, coming from concerning parts of U.S. society, you know, including uh, within certain parts of our national security uh, apparatus. Um, and it seems no branch is, uh, is immune. I wonder what you're seeing um, in the Air Force and how, how we're addressing those, those challenges. I, I am not seeing a significant problem with extremism in the Air Force. Um, that's not to say there are no extremists in the Air Force. There are some, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I'm aware of one criminal case, which, which we're prosecuting. The, um, uh, the attitudes uh, uh, that, that we're addressing there are really a, a, a big problem for our readiness and for the cohesiveness of our organization. And that's true about extremes at an, either mm -hmm. end of the spectrum. Uh, we put out, Secretary Austin put out some new guidance on uh, to try to clarify what what would be uh, a violation of our rules, basically, in regard to active participation with extremist groups. Um, and that's a cautionary thing that mm -hmm. we did. Uh, it has not, over the time it's been out, really fundamentally changed anything that I can see. But I think it's made it easier for commanders to identify situations where there might be a, a concern and, and deal with it effectively. Mm -hmm. that's, gr that's great. Um, Speaking about cohesion uh, within the Air Force, uh, I think the the country and the world were, were just uh, um, uh, really impressed and, and moved by General Brown's uh, comments uh, um, right after the uh, George Floyd's murder. Um, can you tell us about the direction that, that you and he are taking the Air Force uh, towards in combating institutional racism and, and sexism in, in force? Yep. What we're addressing fundamentally is what we call disparities within the service. We're, we do a lot of um, team building training. Um, we try to make all of our leaders as effective as possible leading a diverse team. Mm -hmm. And it's basic, the science is well, well established that uh, a diverse team, uh, if it's pro functioning properly, gets better results. It's better at solving problems. Uh, it focuses, it, it works much more collaboratively and, and collectively to get things done. Uh, so we're, we're encouraging that. Um, we are trying to understand exactly what our posture is. There have been a series of disparity reviews. We've done surveys, essentially, uh, that have pointed out areas such as promotions or military justice and so on. Uh, it also looked at the attitudes of our people mm -hmm. and to understand how they feel about uh, diversity and disparity. And it's, it's been very revealing. Based on that, we've been able to do some things in the training area in particular. Um, uh, and we've also and motivated to do some additional deep dives to try to understand root causes in a few areas. Mm -hmm. So we watch all of this carefully. We're going to be publishing similar data every year. Uh, next, next one will come out in a few months to try to track our progress, mm -hmm. to see if we're actually getting better or not in some of these areas. But it's something we pay a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an important part of our overall readiness. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, you, you said that there are some interesting things that came out of the, um, uh, out of these reviews. Be interested in what, what you found uh, um, particularly notable. Military justice results are different for different groups. Mm -hmm. um, women in general perform, comparatively to men in some areas for promotion, but women of color don't do as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that struck me was the attitudes people have about whether there's an issue with the disparity or diversity or not. And it, and it turns out that white males think there's not, mm -hmm. and people who are not white males think there is, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. in itself tells right. you something about, about where we are. Sure. So there are a number of things like that that we've, we've taken a look at. Yeah. And uh, as you kind of see that and encounter it, what, what are the solutions that you're uh, contemplating? It's largely about uh, consciousness raising and making people understand the value of having a cohesive team. Mm -hmm and that everybody has to be treated with respect and, and with dignity. Um, and you have to, it, it, it becomes a complicated equation because you have to really go deeply into understanding where you might have bias and not realize it, mm -hmm. understanding what behaviors might be perceived in a way which is not welcoming or not mm -hmm. respectful to somebody else. And, and we're, we're not trying to overdo this. We're trying to get people to be 
better leaders. And I can give you examples probably, but uh, one that one that came up uh, uh, recently was about calling people guys. Mm -hmm. One of my generals was talking about how he would normally call his team guys, but he had women on the team. Mm -hmm. And to him, guys were, was, was not a gender specific right. thing. But the women on the team approached him and said, you know, when you say that, we feel left out. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of right. awareness, right? right. Uh, you get a stronger team if yeah. people feel like they're they're appreciated as members of the yeah. team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, we were talking about it a little bit before the uh, before we came on air. Um, this war for talent that uh, um, that the Air Force and you know, well, just about everybody is uh, is confronting, and those those kinds of changes that you need to make internally to to try to. Uh, Recruit, retain, promote, yeah. et cetera, yeah. The, yeah. the talent. Um, so, wonder, the Air Force, uh, in particular, just given your mandate, you're competing head to head against the private sector for a lot of, particularly STEM and uh, cutting edge technology uh, people, as well as people in, in uh, other facets of your operation. Tell me a little bit about what that challenge is and what what the Air Force is doing. Well, if you're listening yeah. and you're interested at all in the military, <laughs> uh, we have a very, very exciting training for people, very exciting fields people can work in. Uh, very, we're a very high-tech organization, right. both the Air Force and the Space Force. Right. The, um, uh, you work on a great team, you, as, as we were just talking about, a team that's cohesive and in which everyone's treated with dignity and respect. Um, you do a very important mission. Uh, there is no more important mission than, than the safety and security of our country and our way of life. Right. So we offer a lot. Um, it, it, whether you stay as a career or you use the, uh, the, the service as a springboard to go do something else, it's a great opportunity for people. Right. And we're trying to make sure people understand that right. and appreciate it. Um, we're, we're doing reasonably well on our recruiting, not as well as we'd like to right mm -hmm. now, and a variety of reasons for that. Uh, but we have a lot to offer, mm -hmm. and we just need to make that as clear to people as can and, and bring people in. We're also reaching out um, to people who are less well represented mm -hmm. and to give, let them know for, of the opportunities that we provide and that there's a chance for them to thrive and to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. Um, but uh, so as of this month, most recently, the, um, the recruiting numbers uh, statistics have, have come out, right? And uh, Air Force is. Uh, uh, looks like it's going to meet its uh, active duty targets, but uh, come up short probably on the reserve uh, and guard goals. Mm -hmm. um, so, tell me how you're assessing things in in that regard, both kind of in the immediate term and how you're looking at the challenges uh, over the horizon on this. And is this is this the way things are looking going forward? Um, I think we'll manage our way through this. Mm -hmm. the, the, we're doing a number of things. We're um, you know, strengthening our recruiting efforts. We're um, actually doing kind of somewhat of an all hands, everyone's a recruiter mm -hmm. uh, kind of an approach. The, the, uh, we're looking at bonuses in certain areas for the, your retention for the people who need the most. We have to compete with the commercial mm -hmm. the world, and it's a tight right. market right now. Right. It may not stay tight forever, but it is for the foreseeable future, so right. we're going to have to uh, compete in that environment. The uh, one thing that has changed, which is, makes us more optimistic, is that during COVID, our recruiters couldn't go into high schools. Right. And that's a principal recruiting sure. you know, place for us. So we're back in the schools now, and I think that's helping. So it's something we're going to work and we're going to monitor and take additional steps to, but I, I think we can manage our way through it. Yeah. Um, in other kind of uh, tactics that the Air Force is uh, um, pursuing and uh, you know, along these lines, um, you know, there's an effort to modernize uniforms, uh, implement a new deployment mm -hmm. model, uh, and expand station choice options. Um, what else are you doing to ensure the active force recruitment goal is, is met? Th th those kinds of, uh, kind of uh, intangible kind of work quality. Yeah, it's sort of an all of the yeah, above. So. We're constantly looking for things that make the service uh, services more attractive. Mm -hmm. The Space Force, by the way, isn't having any trouble okay. recruiting. It's very, it's very small, okay. and it gets a lot of applicants. Right. There's a certain glamour, I think, in being okay. in the Space Force. Sure, sure. And there's also a glamour in being associated with the Air Force. Right. I was just with Carlos Del Toro, Secretary of the Navy, and we, we were talking about uh, Top Gun as okay. a recruiting tool. Okay. 
Yeah. And he pointed out that those were Navy airplanes. Okay. And, and my <laughs> response to him was that we have a lot more fighter airplanes than the Navy does, and we don't make people live on a ship for months in order to fly them. Fair, so, fair yeah, enough, right. A little bit of right. a friendly <laughs> rivalry going on there. Um, and, and by the way, the Air Force Navy game is this weekend, so right. you may get to hear okay. part of that if okay. you watch. Anyway, um, it, 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 it's, it's essentially a, all of the above approach. You right. mentioned several things yep. you're doing. Uh, uh, bonuses. Um, you know, assurances of first assignments or training, things like that that are more attractive to people. We try to be flexible right. uh, as much as we can. We have looked at some of our standards, uh, personal grooming standards, for example. The Space Force just put out a policy that made some changes there. So th we, we, we are constantly looking for things like that that affect the propensity of people to serve. The, 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 the thing we're working against is a general decline in propensity to serve in the country. Okay which by itself I think is a little disturbing. Right. And, and I have to say, the degree of polarization we have, I think, and the lack of trust in government in yeah. general, I, I think is a factor that we're having to contend with. Right. Is the Air Force, uh, how is the Air Force thinking about that challenge, about kind of building, kind of restoring a little bit of trust in public service and, and government institutions and the kind of the yeah. knockdown effects of, of recruitment and The retention. military is still in the most trusted institutions right. in the country. Uh, and I think what we can offer to people is a chance to come into an environment which is apolitical, right. where you're on a team that has a valued mission and all the members of that team are going to work together, whatever their personal beliefs or thoughts about right. any of the political issues right. are. Uh, and they're going to perform well together. And it gives you a chance to maybe get away from some right. of that stuff and come into an environment which is you know, more supportive of people across the, across the spectrum. Right, right. Terrific. No, the, uh, uh, that's the outcome we're all, we're all moving towards, hopefully. So. I, I wrote a piece for Forbes before I came into yeah. office on uh, President, what President-elect Biden at the time, I think, greatest national security challenge was going to be. And I said it was going to be to convince half of America that the other half wasn't evil. Right. It's a continuing challenge, so anyway. Um, turn a little bit to the current events, the actual current event of the day of mm -hmm. this week, uh, Hurricane Ian and uh, um, uh, the remarkable uh, contributions that the Air Force and, the, and all of the other armed services are uh, providing the, the Guard uh, yep. as well to uh, Florida. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you're seeing there, how, how the Air Force has uh, um, kind of been deployed, pre-deployed, how it's responding, uh, sure. its preparedness for this. I mean, we, we, we took action to basically protect our equipment and our installations and our people. Um, and we also took actions to prepare for uh, humanitarian assistance, basically, right. for the relief aid uh, in the event. And all those preparations seem to have paid off. You know, the storm came ashore. Um, you know, it's affected a lot of people. My heart goes out to everybody out right. there who was yep. affected. For I, sure. Yeah. I, my son lives in the Tampa area. Okay. And I have people on my staff who have relatives whose homes are basically underwater. Right. So Come we're on. doing everything we can, uh, working through uh, with FEMA and other parts of the government to offer our assistance to Florida. Right, right. Um, and this is, you know, this event is not the first time um, that the Air Force has uh, encountered the, these kinds of natural mm -hmm. disasters. I mean, we think about, we reflect on the hurricane uh, impacts on uh, Tyndall and, and Offutt for okay. sure. Um, uh, was really seminal uh, examples of the impacts of, of climate change uh, um, and the impacts of climate change on our national security. Um, I wondered to, those seem like real aha moments for uh, for the Pentagon and for the Air Force uh, uh, to the national security impacts of, of climate change. I'm wondering if you can uh, maybe talk a little bit about how the Air Force now is looking at climate, uh, both as a national security sure. risk, uh, kind of how how you're thinking about changes in your operations for mitigation and and obviously ad adaptation. Sure. Several factors. Yeah. Uh, we have a climate strategy that we've been working on that is about to be coming out shortly, but consistent with what the, the Department of Defense is doing. Uh, first of all, we're a consumer of hydrocarbons. Our airplanes burn a lot of fuel. Right. So we're looking at things to be more efficient. Uh, we're looking at things for our bases, like we're going to put a small nuclear reactor in the base in, in, uh, in Alaska. 
Uh, we're trying to do things that generally reduce our consumption of, of hydrocarbons and contribute to the problem. Um, and that covers a lot of areas. We're also looking at our bases. And as we go through our basing decisions and looking at our basing posture, and we're recapitalizing any of our facilities, we're taking climate into consideration, mm -hmm. both from a conservation perspective, but also from the risk that we're having. Mm -hmm. And then frankly, we look at the strategic implications. Um, you know, I, I talk about China, of course, but at, as a military threat, but the implications of climate change globally are going to be dramatic. And they're going to be, you know, we think we have an immigration problem today. Uh, I think that could get much worse. Right. Rising sea level poses a problem you know, for some of our bases yeah. is also. So number of factors there, we're aware of all of them. We're, we're trying to take steps to mitigate e each of those risks. Right, right. How, uh, I, I know this is a kind of a hard to predict uh, question, but it, as you look at these uh, risks that are that are coming coming at you, I mean, how do you see I don't know, the, the budgetary implications, the, uh, you know, as well as just the broader strategic uh, types of changes that the Air Force and the Space Force need to be thinking about. There are things that we can do now, that things that I don't think we're quite ready to do yet, right. that we're going to have to t start to think about. Um, I mentioned some of the things we're doing in the basically conservation area. Uh, there are some technologies coming that, electrification for example, mm -hmm. uh, that, and we do have programs in electric vehicles, uh, air vehicles, uh, you know, helicopter mm -hmm. category basically. We're also looking at electrification on our basis for ground vehicles. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the, a little bit further down the road, we're going to have to think about things like bases like Langley, where I was just last mm -hmm. week, which are two feet above sea level. Right, right. And we're going to have to, that's going to have an impact. Tyndall, as we're re rebuilding on Tyndall, which as right. you mentioned was yeah. devastated earlier, uh, we're building with more hurricane resistance okay. to make sure we're you know, both rising sea level and hurricane effects are taken into account. Right, right. Okay. Now it's a, uh, uh, it's a daunting, it's a daunting challenge. So, um, I think what we might do is take a uh, turn to the audience and see okay. if we can take take some questions. Uh, let me see. the The first one is from uh, the Voice of America. Um, China is developing a sixth generation fighter, while the U.S. next generation air dominance program may be delayed to the 2030s leading some experts to question if the service can deliver its a sixth generation fighter by the end of this, this decade. Could China outpace the U.S. in sixth generation air capabilities? And how do you think the U.S. can close the gap between these timelines? Uh, it's an interesting question, uh, based on a premise that I don't 100% accept mm -hmm. here, okay. but I'm not going to be able to go into much detail okay. about that. Uh, China's been pursuing uh, uh, aircraft technology uh, but they are not a match for the United States. We, we are ahead in aircraft mm -hmm. technology. The, um, the J-20, which is their, their most recent mm -hmm. fighter, is not as good as the F-35, okay. which is our most recent fighter. The next generation air dominance fighter, which will come out of a prototyping X-plane program that I started when I was undersecretary, mm -hmm. um, is going to be better than anything I think the China mm -hmm. can do. We're, we're ahead in areas like uh, engine technology substantially. Mm -hmm. And our access to advanced com computational capability gives us an edge as mm -hmm. well. But China's been very smart about their investments. They're not trying to necessarily do mirror images or mm -hmm. stay ahead in the areas where we're very competitive. Okay. They're looking for ways to get around what we do mm -hmm. with asymmetric approaches. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be aware of that and respond to that as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about fighter v. fighter. It's right. a much more complicated right. equation than that. Can you go a little bit into the asymmetric, uh, how you're assessing their asymmetric approach? Well, sure. I, I mentioned part of that earlier. Yeah. If they can keep our airbase, our airplanes on the airbase, right. or destroy them on the ground, they okay. don't have to worry about having right. a better fighter. So, building hundreds or thousands of uh, ground-launched or sea-launched mm -hmm. or air-launched missiles that can attack those right. bases, basically, is a way to asymmetrically negate our entire okay. fighter force. Right. Um, we, we depend upon, now I'm going to have to be careful what I say here, sure. obviously. Um, they, they are investing in hypersonics. It's okay. another one that's come out. Right. Um, again, they want to be able to reach out a long distance to attack certain targets. And I mentioned some of them earlier in a way which it's very hard for us to defend against. Mm -hmm. So they're going down that path. We're, we're going to be fielding hypersonics also, right. but we're not going to be mirror imaging them necessarily. Okay. Um, one of the, I, am, I am, just in the year I've been back in government, I was out for about four, 
uh, I am impressed, frankly, with the innovation that China is, is bringing forward mm. and, and how they're thinking beyond us. And they're not just trying to counter what they know we're building. They're thinking about what we're going to build next and, and working on the thing to counter that. So they, they are as formidable a threat as I have ever seen technically. Okay. Okay. We are in a race for technological superiority against a thoughtful, well-resourced competitor. Uh, and that race has been going on for some time. And during that, a lot of that time, we've been busy doing counterinsurgency campaigns. Right, right. So. That is sobering. Thank you. Um, let me take the next question from Jane's Defense Weekly. Um, how have Air Force bases been affected by Hurricane Ian? Uh, any fatalities, injuries, or significant damage? Um, there was some damage. I am not aware of any major damage at this point or, or any fatalities. Uh, but reports are just coming mm -hmm. in, so it's, it's a little bit early to, to assess that. Okay. Okay. We did not have a major hit on on a, one of our major bases, right. and we were able to evacuate a lot of our equipment before before the storm arrived. Okay. Okay. And it's still working its way across the Sure. So. Sure. Of course. So. Okay. Um, let's see from the audience. Um, on the note about the importance of the people who serve in our armed forces, can you comment on the new basic needs allowance that the Department of Defense is preparing to implement? for low-income military families to address the widespread problem of food insecurity? You know, it, it, the food insecurity is not a widespread problem in the military, but there are a few people that are affected by it. Okay. Uh, and we're trying to put some things in place to capture, to ensure that those people are, 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 are you know, have a reasonable quality of life from that perspective. Right. So those programs and others are attempting to address that. Uh, we've, been, we've been dealing with housing costs going up right. faster than our system normally responds. Yeah. Um, I just made a change in special duty pay for certain areas to restore some pay that was going to be cut because we had not anticipated the impacts of inflation adequately. Okay, sure. I think that's generally true. Right. Uh, so there are a number of things we're doing. Uh, Secretary Austin just put out a letter on taking care of our people, which okay. uh, also provided some relief in some areas, commissary prices, for okay. example. Uh, which will go directly at food. Right. So we're, we're very conscious of this. Secretary Austin's very, very concerned about quality of life for our people right. and taking care of our people, and, and we all are. So yeah, we're, yeah. there will be some other steps that will, I think, be announced in the not too distant future. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, Mr. Secretary, can you address rare earth materials competition <laughs> like cobalt and supply chain defense sustainment during a major peer conflict? That's a good question. I worked the issue of rare earth metals in particular during our, my previous life. Right. Um, it, it's another area in which investments may be necessary. Right. Rare earth metals aren't actually all that rare. Right. There are some in the United States, there's some in Australia. Uh, China has, to a certain degree, dominated that market, not because they have the rare earth metals, but because they do the processing of them, which right. is very environmentally yep. damaging. And so it's a, it's a constant decision on our part right. to not do that. In, in, and so yep. it's. The other thing is that from the defense point of view, we're a very small fraction of the demand. Right. Most of the demand is for commercial electronics yep. and, and other products. Right. Uh, so we, in, in, a, in an extreme case, we would prioritize national security. Right. So it, it's not something I, I lay awake worrying about at night, but it's something we do need to pay yeah. attention to. Yeah, that, that's for sure. So, Where's the Air Force on its drone wingman pro program? Yeah. Uh, it was one of the things I mentioned when I walked okay. through the seven operational okay. carriers we're okay. working. Um, what we're going to be doing is um, fielding a program of record which will accompany the, the next generation of dominant fighter. Mm -hmm. And you can think of it as a formation controlled by the manned aircraft, the crewed aircraft, with uncrewed combat aircraft right. that okay. are under the control of that quarterback, if you right. will, and uh, operationally used together. There, there have been a number of programs over the last few years that have moved autonomy technology forward. There's a Skyberg program which the Air Force has had in place. There's an ACE program DARPA has been doing, which pit, pitted un, uncrewed uh, uh, autonomy mm -hmm. against fighter pilots, basically, in mm -hmm. simulators. Um, there's a Royal Wingman, Wingman program that Australia has been doing uh, with an American con contractor. But the technologies move forward where I think we can commit ourselves to fielding an uncrewed combat aircraft that will work in a manned unmanned teaming mm -hmm. arrangement in a way that uh, is very cost effective. I mean, one of the problems that addresses is the affordability of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. the, the fighters in particular that we're buying are very expensive. The F-35 is about $85 million a copy. Okay. The F-15EX is about the same. 
the next generation air dominance fighter that I mentioned earlier is going to be multiples of that number. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to bring something in. If we're going to keep a force structure that we need, right. we've got to bring some lower cost things into it. And uncrewed combat aircraft right. give us that opportunity. Sure, sure. Now that makes sense. Um, what lessons have you and the service learned thus far from the war in Ukraine? Uh, there's a large combination of things, yeah. and of course it's not over. Right. Um, I, I mentioned a couple earlier, uh, we learned some things about how much quality matters right. and how much training yep. matters yep. and proficiency and professionalism right. and motivation. Right. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the motivation of the Ukrainians is dramatically greater than the motivation right. of the people they're facing. And uh, there's not uh, the U.S. equipment that's being used in particular uh, is showing its, its quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Russian equipment showing its quality. Right. There's a big disparity there. The importance of air superiority. Uh, enough Russians have been unsuccessful, right. largely because they were not able to right. achieve air, air superiority. And a lot of detailed lessons about the reasons why they were not, right. and uh, that we can apply tactically to, to our forces. So there's, there's still a lot of things happening. Um, the uh, utility of space yeah. in support of a conflict and how you use space in support of a conflict. Um, command and control lessons. Yep. So there, there are quite a few. As right. We we were not a, we haven't assessed them all yet. Sure. But sure. there's some that are fairly obvious right. that we can see now. Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, Value precision weapons is another one. Right. Sure. Uh, information security is one of the seven areas of focus that the secretary outlined. What level of importance do you put on low Earth orbit satellite systems that use laser guided communications technology? I think the question is about laser crosslinks, basically, okay. that are used. Okay. Um, that's an emerging technology that has, you know, has a lot of cost effectiveness. Right. It, it can't be jammed very easily. Yeah. Um, there, there are, if I understood the question correctly, um, low Earth orbiting satellites bring, are proliferating, first of right. all. They're large commercial networks. Yeah. Scar, uh, Starlink is a good example that are being, being fielded. Uh, not sure how that marketplace is going to sort itself out, but we want to take advantage of it. Right. So there are a lot of functions that these 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 commercial uh, organizations uh, can provide to the military, right. and we are in conversations with them. We have an office that is dedicated to, to those 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 relationships, right. and we're also taking advantage of uh, their design practices, which are much more cost effective, much less expensive right. at least than the ones we've traditionally used for military satellites. Okay. So there's a lot in that world that's coming coming out that, right. that is informing our own space yeah. programs. Interesting, interesting. Um, so there was a question from Inside Defense. Uh, earlier this year, you said the Air Launch Rapid Response Weapon, ARRW, needed to prove itself. Since then, there have been a handful of successful tests. Has your opinion on the program changed? Could you tell us your thoughts on HACM following last week's announcement of the Raytheon contract? Um, the HACM is moving forward. Okay. Yeah, we got to a point where we're ready to commit to development of HACM okay. uh, and to select the contractor. I can't say a great deal more about okay. that one. Arrow has had some tests, but they're they're part of a series of tests that get to full up capability, and they're not through that series yet. Yeah. I am encouraged by by what they've done. They've corrected some of the problems that were evident in the first two okay. tests. Um, the, there are questions for all hypersonics about cost effectiveness. Right. And whether whether they make sense relative to other non-hypersonic right. or conventional weapons, uh, one of the features of hypersonic weapons is they tend to cost a lot. Okay, sure. uh, just because of what they're built right. to do. Right. So we're, we're we're going to continue down the path of fielding hypersonic weapons. You know, we'll be making individual decisions about each one. You know, based on a combination of their their progress and their cost effectiveness. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, another question from James. Can you share your thoughts on the milling, uh, milling plant that a Chinese company wants to build near Grand Forks Air Force Base? Um, I cannot. Yeah, I would imagine <laughs> not. <laughs> I would imagine not. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What will it take to have and keep superiority in space? Oh, that's a big question. That is a that's big a question. That's a very big yeah. question. Yeah. What we want is a peaceful domain in space right. in which um, the nations that are involved there can operate and do the scientific things, the commercial things they right. want to do, and not be worried about threats. Yeah. We also want a space in which uh, the functions that we count upon for security 
are, are, are reliable yeah. and resilient against attack. We, we you know, the, the unfortunate truth is that space has become, to a certain degree, militarized. And we, we have relied on space for certain services for a long time. Um, the, the, uh, both Russia and China have been fielding space systems to support their military operationally uh, for strategic reasons, and they've both been working on offensive capability to, to counter our space systems. So we, we, we cannot mm -hmm. ignore that. Uh, there are two things that the Space Force has to do for us. It has to provide uh, services that our joint force counts upon to go to war. Uh, communications, uh, sensing, targeting, right. uh, position navigation timing, as well as the strategic services right. they provide. Um, we also have to ensure that the, the, the joint force can't be targeted by the other right. side's space assets. So that, that's the dynamic yeah. that we have to deal with. Um, a, a characteristic of space, unfortunately, is that it's a sort of a no man's land where people can, the, each side has the other side under observation. Okay. And there's an instability associated right. with that because whoever moves first can have a significant advantage. Yep. Okay. So you have to design to mitigate that. Right. So it, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate fact of our lives that space is going in this direction. Yeah. But uh, you know, we, we again recognized this in the Obama administration. Right. We changed our strategy. Yep. We started figuring out what it implied what we had to do. The Trump administration actually moved that thinking forward. Okay. And we're continuing down that path. Right. It's imposed upon us by the threat. Sure, sure. Okay, good. Um, we're coming to the end of the program. I've got one last uh, question. Um, Saturday, Air Force, Navy, what's, what's the prediction, Mr. Secretary? Um, I, I tend to not do that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> there are two things I don't like to predict. One is the uh, the future of acquisition programs okay. and development, <laughs> and the other is sporting events. Okay, okay. Uh, but I have a lot of confidence in the Air Force team. Okay, okay, very good. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Don't ask me about Army Air Force. Okay, I want, to, I want to do that <laughs> either. So, okay. <laughs> I have problems with both of those okay. teams. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, this was a wide-ranging and really <laughs> fascinating conversation. Um, I think not necessarily a, a conventional discussion about national security, but but really, I think covering all aspects of the challenges that that our country are facing, and it's just uh, uh, it uh, it restores a lot of confidence in me to see <laughs> just um, you know such a, uh, a visionary uh, and strategic thinker like you Thank leading you. Le leading our work there. So. Thank you very much for, for your time here. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Good to be good. with you. Thanks, sir.